operating at an extraordinary level can seem challenging. Learn how to survive in the lone wolf economy in the OG Money Podcast with Lonnie Gordon Agolnik. Drawing on over 20 years of experience in the trenches of Wall Street, Lonnie explores what it takes to be successful in today's rapidly changing environment. From daily routines, wealth strategies, and sustaining the highest levels of wisdom, Lonnie and his guests unpack proven ways to live an extraordinary life. Welcome to the OG Money Podcast. Today's guest is one of the realists in the game right now, a real OG. We go back a bit. Uh, Ryan Harwood, welcome. Good to see you. Good to see you as well, Lonnie. All right, so we're going to take it back a minute. I like to go backwards before we get to where we are right now. So uh, I want to start somewhere, tennis career. You're a, a high school tennis star, and then you end up becoming number one tennis player at Wharton right? University of Pennsylvania. So when did you get into tennis and uh, take us on the trajectory of when you got to tennis into becoming the number one player at uh, UPenn? Sure. I play, I started playing tennis at a little bit of an older age compared to the guys I, I ultimately started competing against later in life. I started around like 10 years old and it was I was at sleepaway camp and I kept, you know, how in free play, they almost let you choose your own activity in like one of the slots. I kept gravitating back towards tennis because, you know, I guess I was naturally better than some of the other kids in, in the bunk. And when you're a kid, you like to be better than other people at things. So I kept choosing tennis as the free play slot. And the counselors told my parents, like, he clearly likes tennis a lot. Maybe you should get him some lessons. And, I went home and I started taking lessons and, you know, at first you you think you're good because you're beating kids in, in uh, sleepaway camp, but then you start realizing the whole world of the sport. And I started playing against guys, you know, kids that were playing since they were four or five years old. And I really started to get a taste for what real tennis players were doing, how much they were practicing, um, what their, you know, their goals were to become professional tennis players. And that was a rude awakening and a huge wake up call. And, I'm the type of person that my DNA, I'm a competitive person. And once I started seeing that world and that there were so many people that much better than me, I I just wanted to keep going and going. So I'd say when I reached 12 years old, 13 years old, at that point, I, I fully went all in and I was playing multiple times per week and got a real coach and was playing competitive tournaments on the regular on weekends and then, you know, had my first real breakthrough when I was probably like 14 years old in a tournament, in a USTA tournament, um, started being beating guys that were, you know, ranked top 10, top 15 in, in the East Coast, in the, what we called the ETA back then. And that's when I thought that I had a shot at being, you know, real good and amped it up even further and started playing basically six days a week or five days a week and then tournaments and it became a real, a real thing, basically sacrificed a lot in high school, missed a lot of parties, missed a lot of trips that, that my friends would take and eventually got recruited by a bunch of different schools when I was looking at colleges. And Were you on the high school team or did, did you not have time for that? I did play high school tennis and a lot of people that were ranked in, you know, the top 10, top 15 in their region didn't play high school tennis, but I did because my school asked me to, we actually had a pretty good tennis team and Long Island was actually pretty competitive for tennis. It wasn't like a complete joke. So I did. And it was, I, you know, I'm actually really happy I did because it, it's the worst conditions ever, right? You're playing basically in the fall and winter <laughs> in, in right. New York and everything is against you and you're playing guys that I was expected to beat, but that were good players. Like they definitely, they were ranked probably like 20 in the East or 15 in the East when I was ranked like four in the East. And so these were guys I'm supposed to beat and mentally you don't want to lose to anyone. You don't want them going around with bragging rights and tournaments and stuff, even though it didn't really count. Right. So it was, it was a lot of people avoid that they dodge and weave it because they don't want that. They don't want to take a loss that they're not supposed to, even though it doesn't count against their ranking. But I didn't, I played it. And it was, I think it was one of the best things I did because it, it just makes you that much tougher, that much more resilient, that much more not prone to pressure folding under pressure. Cause 
these were literally the you're playing on cracked courts at high schools, bad bounces, like it would start drizzling and you still have to play. <laughs> like it right, was, right. it was bad as it gets. And I, you know, I loved it. It was, it was, it was fun. And my friends were on the team. My best friend was on the team. So he played like fourth singles or first double. So it was a really good experience. Yeah. They say, show me the kid and I'll show you the adult. Like how much do you believe in that? Like that 14, 15 year old kid right now, is that kid still in there? That competitive maniac? 1000%. I think that the, the main difference is, that I've learned to control that over the years. I don't feel the need to, you know, puff the chest and do all that stuff that maybe I did when I was younger. You know, I had a, definitely probably had a little bit of a temper when I was younger. Or if I lost maybe crack a racket a year or two when I was 14 years old, that stuff you learn how to control your emotions and how to control and contain the competitive fire, which I think is one of the best lessons ever of being an athlete at a young age is, you learn to control that. I also got a lot of, you know, a lot of that out of me because I played for 15, 20 years in a very meaningful stage where there was a lot on the line and I got a lot of that out of me. So I don't feel the need to like get that out in other outlets in ways that might be unhealthy, if that makes sense. hundred percent. Yeah. So I still have that in me, no doubt. And I've transferred that to business, but obviously in business, you, you can't do what you would do in sports sometimes. So it's, it just manifests in different ways. Cause so, so now you get recruited to UPenn, you go uh, to, to a, an unbelievable school, right? And uh, you do both the fraternity life, right? And you're playing as number one. Is that correct? So what was that like um, being the number one player at university of Pennsylvania and also, you know, doing the party scene with the fraternity? Yeah. So, I want to give credit where credit's due. When I showed up to the school, I wasn't playing number one from day one. I played number two. Um, and then I, I eventually got to number one. There was a Czech guy uh, named Fonda Statesko, who was a, you know, a good friend. And he came from the Czech Republic and he played when I was a freshman, he was a sophomore. He played number one singles uh, for my freshman and sophomore year. And then I became number one singles. So, but yeah, I played one and two basically my whole career. And I went on a lot of recruiting trips in order to choose what college I wanted to go to and ultimately ended, landed on Penn. It felt right. Just subjective gut. It felt like the place for me. It was a very, um, you know, a lot of people that like to have fun too, which I didn't want to completely give up knowing how much I would have to give up in by being a varsity athlete. And I did do a fraternity and I, I did that because Greek life was a big part of UPenn and I didn't want to miss out on that experience, but inevitably I, I did have to sacrifice a lot of that experience. I missed half the parties, half the experiences that my friends were going through. I mean, spring fling was a big thing at UPenn. It was like the party of the year that a lot of other colleges would come to and visit friends. And I never got to experience spring fling once in my four years, which is heartbreaking, but that's part of the game, right? You have to learn to sacrifice. So it was a balancing act. I think anything in life is a balancing act. Like when people ask me like for advice on work-life balance, I always say that work-life balance is kind of a myth because it's a constant recalibration of what's going on in your life at that moment. If home needs more of my attention, then I need to focus on home. If work needs more of my attention, then I'm going to be all in on work. At that time, it was like, in my soul, did I need to have fun in order to be a well-rounded student that I needed to lean into fraternity life more? If I needed to lean into tennis more, if I needed to lean into schoolwork more, it really just depended on the moment in time. Oh, yeah, schoolwork. You had to fit that in, too. <laughs> <laughs> Almost forgot about that. Um, so then fast forward, like, uh, I, I remember meeting you. You came in to Wall Street when I was running a firm on Madison Avenue. What was that experience like taking all of the tennis, the fraternity, the school, the mind, and then bringing that into the workplace? Uh, you were the last probably of a dying breed of, a, of, of a, a group of kids that went through what I would consider the Navy SEALs boot camp of sales. Like that, that was the last generation, I would say, of, of, of a group of kids that really went through the, the, the toughness of what it takes to, to make it on Wall Street. Yeah. What was that like? 
it was it was awesome. I mean, I played professional tennis for a very very short stint after college, mainly because I didn't want to hang the racket up yet. I I. I got injured for the first time in my life. I actually got a little bit of an elbow injury, which prevented me from being able to, to serve as big as I was in, in my prior career, which was a, my main weapon. So I had to hang up the racket. So that was a very short stint. And, but I didn't go through the normal recruiting of everybody else on, on kind of like where you were going to go to work. So I wanted to just get some experience and, and ultimately you know, you guys gave me that shot and, and basically brought me in on that crop of, of that training class. And I wanted to see if like Wall Street was for me. And that was my first taste of it. And like you said, it really was a boot camp and Navy SEALs of sales. And I, I still look back on that time period. There's a, a, a lot of things you learn when going through that experience, mainly how not to get offended when you hear the word no um, not to kind of like shun away and just go into a shell. Like a lot of people don't like that. And, and you can't be scared of, of no, you need to, you need to close that loop. You need to get a yes or no and, and move on. Or even if you do get a no, make sure that they, you know, heard you correctly type thing and that you articulated yourself properly so that, you know, they were saying no to the right thing. So resilience, thick skin, how to phrase things properly so that you are giving yourself a better shot at making a sale. All of those things were major cornerstones of what I think has made me successful in my career. And I think, I think everyone needs to learn that stuff in life. I, I, you know, I think it's one of these things that no matter what your industry is, no matter what your job is, whether it's internal politics, because you have to sell internally too, get people on board with your vision um, or externally trying to bring revenue into your firm that year that I spent with you guys at LT, like it was awesome. I learned a ton from you and Brez and gold, like you guys, it was awesome. It really was. And I was a young kid, right? So that, that shaped my ability to sell going forward throughout my career. Right. So I, re I just remember like there was this kid that you had that special, uh, that it, you know, that, that, that you just knew at some point, you know, you were going somewhere, whether it was going to be in finance with us there or somewhere else. Um, we used to walk back when it was in snowstorms and 24 just started and you were convinced you were Jack Bauer. Like, I remember that like it was yesterday, right? Like those were some good walks home. But, um, you know, as a, as a sales leader back then of that firm, I just remember taking you under my wing and, and, and wanting to give you a little more attention. And then we just created a real bond and a friendship. And like, you know, at that point you were, you know, if there was a party, I'd call you up and say, Ryan, where are we going tonight? I met a girl and you're like, oh, I got you, you know, and we would go out, we'd have a good night. And you guys were always in the corner with like packed heads, like 25, 30 deep minimum running the place. I mean, and you know, I was almost, I was like five, six years older. So um, I was like, <laughs> happy to have a spot to go to. So uh, then you head off to, you know, the big leagues. You go through, you know, um, I remember just speaking of Jack Bauer, you were like, you know, talking to me and you're like, I just had a CIA interrogation going to, to Goldman Sachs. Like, you know, you're starting this bank and you're like, it's just been insane, you know? What was that like now moving up the ladder to the top investment banking firm on Wall Street? What was that whole experience like? Yeah. So it was a very different job, very different position I was taking. It wasn't a, a sales focused position, but I did feel that um, learning from that culture and some of the people within those walls was going to be a really interesting opportunity to see how they run their business. Um, and that's ultimately what it was, right? It was, it was the private bank. It was a non-existent business. I was one of the initial people on the, the startup team to build a bank within the walls of Goldman Sachs. And, um, Ultimately, it was from scratch. Like we had to get a charter in Salt Lake City and it was pitched to Lloyd Blankfein at the time and got approved. And then we started building out a bank and infrastructure to take deposits in from our clients, both personal, private wealth and institutional, but then also make loans to clients because Goldman never made individual loans to clients at the time. It was a great learning experience, particularly in terms of watching how my two bosses, my managers 
managed a team and started up a business and how they ran the P and L um, because ultimately that prepared me to be confident enough to take the leap to start my own business back in 2010. So it was the right move. I learned a lot from those guys, but ultimately what I also learned was that corporate America wasn't for me. Um, I wanted to create my own destiny and big believer in meritocracy in terms of like what you put in is what you get out. And I didn't want to have to rely on once I got to a certain stage on what I call, you know, internal politics. And I'm not saying Goldman has internal politics more so than any other corporate America company. That's just the reality of corporate America though, right? It's, it's right place, right time sometimes, as opposed to if I work my tail off, I create my own path and destiny when you own your own business sometimes. So that's, it was a great experience and that's what led me to, to launching pure wild eventually. Yeah. So do you remember, uh, I used to, you know, help you out here with this Thrillist brand, right? Like Lon, you know, shoot this out to your network, you know, Thrillist, it's this new thing. Like you're going to love it. I kind of did love it. So I mailed it out to everyone I knew, but Thrillist was really the start before the pure wow. Right. So yeah, my friend, my, my good friend, Ben is going to, um, love that you just said that now that he knows that I was like really trying to promote his brand. So yeah. I, uh, my best friend from college, Ben started Thrillist and, um, I was watching him and that was a big reason he was having so much fun and a lot of success building this digital startup in the media space. And, you know, that was one of the reasons why I started exploring the media and technology space overall, and ultimately wanted to find a white space in that business model. And that was the initial impetus for pure wow. Um, we kind of replicated that business model that Daily Candy had, which was before Thrillist, and then the Thrillist had. And obviously, these business models have evolved enormously over the past, let's call it, decade. So there's nothing like it looked back then. But yeah, they were a major inspiration for why I wanted to go start a business, particularly in that arena, just with a very different demographic. Yeah. So I don't know if you remember this, but I, I think I had just started writing the book Heart of the Beast or I finished it. But I met you. I saw you at Turnberry in Miami and uh, you were visiting and you're like, Lon, uh, you know, this pure wow company. Uh, I got my 10th employee. Like you're like, it's moving in the right direction. That was just a few years ago. Right. And where are you now on pure wow? I mean, this thing just blew up like within the last couple of years no? I would say it's as before that, like I started in 2010, I'd say we started to really take off in like early 2013. Um, and then by the time that 2015 rolled around, we were a pretty established digital media company at that stage um, with, you know, a sizable revenue pool and audience size. So I'd say 2015, took me about five years to like really be a player that people were like, okay, they're here to stay. And then I, I raised a little bit of money in 2015 because I really bootstrapped this thing, um, raised very little capital. So I raised a little bit in 2015 and then I ultimately ended up selling the business in 2017 um, to Gary Vaynerchuk and Steve Ross. And we essentially created Gallery Media Group to be a parent company for many media assets that we were going to build out and manage. So Pure Wow now sits under Gallery Media Group. So it's still very much uh, a major focus of, of mine. It's still a very, very profitable asset and one that's still growing. So Pure Wow is still definitely a major focus. So whose idea was 137 p.m.? Who, uh, yeah. Because I love 137 p.m. Uh, so, Thanks. I mean, it is just one of my favorite go-to uh, Instagram spots. I, I mean, and, and, and the, the, the drops and like everything that, you know, I, I love it. So to, who started that idea? Was that you and Gary collabing together or? Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, definitely. We, I always wanted to start a men's media brand, even when I was starting Pure Wow, but it just didn't make sense at the time for many reasons. The competitive landscape wasn't as attractive. I didn't have a... a a viewpoint on the space that felt like there was a white space. So 
I didn't do it back then. Um, but when I always wanted to, I always knew at some point I would personally. And then when I was acquired by Gary V, it was almost like, okay, like, obviously we're going to do this. We have one of the most popular influencers in the social media space for the youth male culture demographic. He knows everything about all the topics that matter in culture, whether it's gaming and esports, emerging hip hop artists, sports cards, sneakers, NBA, soccer, like all of it, like is within his wheelhouse. And we both basically had this um, consumer insights machine because of who his audience was and how engaged they were in his content. So we almost used his personal channels as a consumer insights machine to drive what 137 was going to be. So it was definitely, um, you know, Gary was heavily involved in the creation of that. And, you know, the name 137 PM came from the fact that this whole brand was about like own your future and start this minute. Like, don't wait to chase your dreams, get off your ass right now. So it was purposely a random minute in the day to show that like, don't overanalyze, don't wait for the right moment to make that move. Like sometimes it's never going to be perfection. You just got to go and you got to do, and you got to taste and you got to try. And 137 was just, it happened to be, I think it was like that time that we were like jamming on this and we were like random minute of the day. And then we got, it got excited that like a media company could be very cool if we owned a minute of the day because we can do like the 1.37 a.m. after party at Super Bowl or the 1.37 p.m. every day we're going to do something. And that has manifested a little bit. I remember when we first started, we had like Ninja from the esports world was retweeting us at 1.37. Even The Rock and Richard Branson did it once or twice. So it started to become a thing in culture. Um, and, you know, I'm still confident we're eventually going to find some other things that could really be something that are stays. Yeah, so let me ask you a quick, quick question on Gary Vee. I'm a big Gary Vee fan. Um, he He's like a little bit, I, I kind of relate a little more to him as the C student, right, in school. Yeah. And uh, he's a big proponent of like, you know, um, I wasn't a good student, but at the same time you went to UPenn, right? So do you guys ever have any conversations regarding those two worlds of like, which one is better or it's it's irrelevant. It's like there's some unbelievable entrepreneurs that come out of UPenn and, and that world and then this street hustler that didn't necessarily get good grades, you're going to get guys like Gary Vee and me, right? Like it's just yeah. like it. I don't think that – I think it's more of what's inside the heart than it is, you know. What What are your thoughts yeah. on that? A hundred percent. It's what's inside the heart. I think that it's all case by case to the human being um, meaning <clears throat> you are a product of your environment. You're a product of your upbringing. Um, I think there are a ton of entrepreneurs that came out of great schools that got great grades that are great entrepreneurs. And then there's obviously amazing entrepreneurs that had no choice, but to make it with their bare hands. Right. You know, I think that with Gary, I think the unique thing is that he's obviously an immigrant that came from nothing. I think immigrants that come from nothing, if you have that talent, man, I mean, their drive is just bonkers because right. they literally, they literally knew what it was like to have nothing and they never want to go back there again. So it's a different type of, um, uh, you know, Edge. fuel to the fire. Yeah. But, but that being said, yeah, we, we had fun with it. We debated on it. Cause I remember when I first met Gary, like, I don't know, I want to call it maybe 2011, 2012, way before we became business partners, you know, he would always razz and, and, and say things like, you know, Ivy leaguers, you know, can't, you know, can't do their thing. They can't have right. the hustle drive and stuff. But over time, he's definitely changed his viewpoint on that. Yeah. He's seen plenty of people that have come out that have gotten good grades and are, are were from good schools that have the drive and that are willing to get their hands to really dirty. I think his viewpoint back then was the fact that a lot of people that, come out of these schools they like to pontificate they like to read they like to overthink do hypotheses and focus groups and right. like not do they right. don't want to get their hands dirty right. and there there are a ton of people like that there are but there's also a ton of people that aren't like that 
from all walks of life. So I think you're going to get people that are on both sides of the coin, no matter where you look. Yeah, I agree. So I, I just want to give you a little throwback to me. I was a 13, 14 year old kid and I was at the Nassau Coliseum, Pickwick Motor and you name it. I had card booths at 13, 14 years old selling every baseball card you can imagine. Right. So that was my first business. But when I left the business, right, I sold all, not all of my baseball cards, but most of them. And I started buying basketball and hockey. Yeah. And I was like thinking in the future, like these are worthless, like Michael Jordan rookie cards and, you know, Robinson, like all these different cards. And I'm seeing because I started following your collection and I'm like, oh, my God, I got to go to my mother's basement. I don't even know what I have in there. These yeah. cards are flying through the roof. I can't even imagine what I've got. I got Wayne Gretzky rookie cards, I think. And yeah, I, I don't even know. I could have a small fortune right now in there. What's yeah, going on with the with the hockey cards and and the basketball cards? What, what, where do we... I'm, I'm, yeah, I mean the, the the sports card market has has taken off like wildfire for for a couple of reasons. One, as we all know, cash is doing nothing for us right now. There's like no reason to be sitting in cash. You can't earn anything. Um, so people are looking for alternative asset classes to put their money. It's why Bitcoin has taken off. As what are well. your thoughts on Bitcoin, by the way? It's it's not my area of expertise to sit here and opine on Bitcoin. I don't know enough about it. I never really, I did invest in it, but it was because, you know, everyone else was doing it type of thing. Like I definitely didn't know, I didn't put a lot of money in. It wasn't something that I knew what I was doing. It was more like I understood, I understood the scarcity element of it. And I understood the, the non-regulation element of it. And that was interesting to me. But other than that, the reason why I've completely pivoted to sports card is because I truly understand it. And I think I have a competitive advantage and I, and I love it and I'm passionate about it. And with sports cards, the reason why it's taken off in my opinion is that you, you have this perfect storm of a sitting in cash is not smart, et cetera. B you have the smart money starting to realize the big money starting to realize that this is a real asset class and that they should pay attention to it. You even saw like, you know, Nat Turner and Stevie Cohn bought PSA, like some real players are coming into the space. And then on the bottom end, you have these fractionalization companies and, and markets being formed like Collectible and Dibs.io and Rally, where you have a kid in his basement that has a thousand dollars. He can buy a couple shares of a Michael Jordan rookie card, PSA nine. And now all of a sudden the masses can get involved. So there's a marketplace so it's being squeezed from the top and the bottom. That's B. C, basketball is just the most, the NBA is the most culturally relevant sport and thing. It, it, it is street culture, right? NBA is street and street is NBA and hip hop is NBA and NBA is hip hop. It's, it matters in culture big time. So I focus primarily on basketball, but, but yes, I mean, all cards have risen, everything from hockey to baseball to football, et cetera. Um, I also think you have this generation of kids that focused on sneakers for so long and flipping sneakers. And there were markets like goat and stock X that formed. And that is a mature industry now that has dried up for some of the people that traded in volume. So they've shifted their focus to finding pockets, pockets of liquidity in sports cards. And then on top of that, you also have like 45, 50, 55 year old dads that now have kids that are like eight, to 15 years old that love the sport. And this is a bonding experience for them to throw, you know, a couple hundred grand into this and invest with their kid and make it something that they're both passionate about. So all of those things together has make it made an explosion of the market. And I don't think it's going anywhere. I think it's a real asset class that's staying around for a while. And we're in the second inning of a nine inning game. It's amazing. You know, it's almost like, you know, I always say like, I don't, I'm not into art, but there's so many people that are into art what I hear is by art you love, not necessarily what's such a great investment. And I think looking at your basketball card collection, you do that, right? Like you, you buy the guys that you love and then they just happen to be the best players and, and they make a good investment, right? I do it a little bit differently. I'm a, you know, while I am a huge NBA fan and a collector, I am an investor first. So I don't play by the rules of buy the art you love. Um, mainly because I, I am an investor, not a collector first. So I have a specific strategy, which is 
Oh, so this uh, is I, legit, man. This isn't like a hobby. This is something you, you you're taking like real seriously, huh? I am. I am. Oh, wow. I really am. It's, it's it's it is a hobby because I love it. Right. But but it is it is an important part of my my investing strategy. Did the um, Elon Musk uh, purchase of Bitcoin one hundred uh, one point five billion on their balance sheet? Did that make you do a double take in Bitcoin, or or that's just not your thing? You're not interested in it. Like no, you know. it's. It, I have investments in like, I, I have an investment in a, in a coin hedge fund. Like okay. I've, I have some exposure to that industry. It's just not one that I fully grasp, honestly. Right. So it's not one that I'm looking to like dive into. Whereas this is something that comes very naturally to me. Yeah. What's um, interesting, Ryan is like, I speak to, let's just say 100 anywhere between a millionaires to billionaires. And there's like three or four that got their heads wrapped around Bitcoin. It's so early. Yeah. That's what I th I think in that because I'm down that rabbit hole, you know, in a big way. But um, I'm gonna wrap this up because I know you're a busy guy. But I want to ask you one question. Um, yeah. coming from the little kid being on the uh, tennis court to yeah. running one of the biggest, best uh, media companies that are in the country today. If you were to leave my audience that listens to people that want to know what it takes to be a beast and, and how do you get from really nothing where you were when I first met you to, you know, the top or, or close on your way to the top of the mountain. What advice would you give that kid or person that's listening today? There are absolutely no shortcuts. It, anyone that you've seen that has, has had success has put the work in and you need to believe in yourself in the sense that like there are moments where I had my head down for a year or two years or three years and uh, you know, I doubted something here and there, but I, I kind of believed in the macro vision, but even in the micro, maybe it didn't feel like it was working, but I still put my head down. I, and I did everything that I thought was the right thing to do and just worked my ass off, like my ass off. And I picked my head up every few years and it was like, that worked. And that that's where I am now. And then, it, and then it happens again, same cycle. You put your heads down for a couple years and you're like, ah, oh, it feels like it's not moving. And then two years later, you're like, it did work. Yeah, it did work. And you know, you can't doubt yourself when you have a vision and you need to just put the work in and not look at, yes, of course you have short-term milestones, but progress doesn't happen overnight. It really doesn't. And it took me 10 years to build this brand and everyone thinks it's an overnight success because they, you know, they still remember when I first was talking about starting it. And, but it's been 10 years. That's a long time. And you have to have patience and you have to put the work in. And there's literally, there really is no shortcuts. And that's what I would leave with the audience because a lot of people are looking for shortcuts. Amen, man. Amen. I, I agree. I really appreciate the time you took. It's great to see you. I look forward after COVID kind of dissipates a little bit more. We can get out there. Maybe you can whoop my ass on the tennis courts. But uh, if it's not my ass, I'll come watch you play in one of those pros in Williams Island. All right. Good luck in all you do. Let's stay in touch. All right, my man. Great job. Thanks. Love. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the OG Money Podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available.